Hello Fanatics! Welcome to Diamond Potent Fanatics. I am Cindy and here we are. It is Thursday and you know what that means. True crime episode. If you are new here, hello. I talk about a true crime uh, while doing my diamond painting and I have been roped back in. I have been asked to do more of them, which is amazing and I'm loving it. I was looking into a new episode and I suddenly thought, I haven't put a disclaimer on my video. So please, viewer discretion is advised because some of the people that we talk about are very sick individuals that do atrocious acts of violence and murder and rape and vile human beings. Nine times out of ten, they get their comeuppance. They get sent to jail. Sometimes they don't. So the next story that I looked into, I suddenly thought I need to update my introduction to my videos and you get to see me again so it's not all bad thank you so much for joining me if you'd be so kind if you do enjoy my youtube channel uh, my true crime my spiritual so far my unboxings anything hit that subscribe button i would love to have you on my journey with me thank you so much for joining me on my true crime journey I'm loving it and I hope you guys are too. Can I just quickly say, because we talk about a wide range of subject areas, um, I personally myself have been abused for many, many years. If I trigger anything, please don't sit on your own. Please seek help. Reach out to me, chat to me, reach out to a friend or medical professional people. Therapy works wonders, promise. With that said, let's move on to another depraved individual and find out what they've done this week. Who's it going to be? Stay tuned to find out. Stay safe out there. Hello, true crime fanatics. Welcome back to another episode. My son is downstairs. I have asked him to keep the volume down. Don't think that's going to happen. Moving on. Today we're going to talk about two sick individuals. David and Catherine Bernie, uh, they are an Australian couple, so we're going to Australia today, from Perth in Western Australia, who murdered four women at their home in 1986 and attempted to murder a fifth. These crimes were referred to in the press as the Morehouse murders. After the Bernies address at 3 Morehouse Street in Willoughby, a suburb of Perth. Join me as we discuss these disgusting individuals. I did come across this um, episode while looking for something else <laughs> so yeah let's find out what they did because i haven't pre-read it i don't know what they have done i and i like that because you get my genuine reactions and my sarcasm thrown in sorry david john burney was the oldest of five children he grew up in semi-rural suburb of wattle grove in western australia School friends and parishioners from 
the Wattle Grove Baptist Church of the period remember the family as having been dysfunctional. Rumours surrounded the family's promiscuity and alcoholism and that they engaged in incest. When David's parents asked the local priest to conduct their wedding ceremony, he expressed concerns about them as individuals and as a potential couple, broadly stating that he felt theirs was a union that could lead could never lead to any good. An unusual and unseemingly unsuited pairing. The father was a man of a very small stature and unattractive appearance, while the mother was known for her coarse manner and use of profanities and bad behaviour, often exchanging sexual favours with taxi drivers as payment for fares. One way to get around. David's school friends also commented that the family home was unkempt and filthy, that the family never had regular meals together. His parents did not cook meals for the children. In the early 1960s, David's parents decided to move the family to another Perth suburb, where David met Catherine Harrison through mutual friends. At 15, David left school to become an apprentice jockey for Eric Parnham at a nearby Ascot racecourse. During his time there, he physically harmed the horses and developed a habit of, I can't say this word, and I I should be able to because I run events, exhibitionism, showing off. There we go. (laughs) One night, David broke into the room of an elderly lady where he was boarding. He was naked with stockings over his head and he attempted to commit his first rape. By the time he was an adolescent, he was convicted of several crimes in and he was in and out of prison for misdemeanors and felonies. As an adult, he became a sex and pornography addict and paraphiliac. Okay, I'm just going to look up what this means. Sexual perversion and sexual deviation. That's not good. I like to get clarification on the words that I'm saying. He married his first wife during his early 20s and the couple had a daughter, Tanya. Tanya was 10 years old at the time of his arrest. She had never married and had no children, stating, quote, I don't want to spawn another David Burney. Her surname is unknown to the media. In late 1986, David was employed at a local car record shop. For more than a year, David and Catherine had been practising how to make their sexual fantasies of rape and murder come true, while he was weeks away from committing his first murder. But before we go there, we have to discuss Catherine. Catherine Margaret Burney was born on the 23rd of May in 1951. She was two years old when her mother Doreen died, giving birth to her brother, who died two days later. Unable to raise her, her father Harold sent Catherine away to live with her maternal grandparents. When she was ten, a custody dispute resulted in Harold regaining sole custody of Catherine. At the age of twelve, she met David, and by the age of fourteen, She was in a relationship with him. Harold begged Catherine on several occasions to leave David due to the fact that he was often getting in trouble with the local police, but his disapproval of their relationship only strengthened their reunion. Of course it did. It is well documented, but 
yeah her time in her time in prison throughout her adolescent years affect, offered Catherine a chance to break away from David encouraged by a parole officer Catherine began working for the McLaughlin family as a housekeeper she married Donald McLaughlin on her 21st birthday she and McLaughlin sorry don't like using surnames Donald she and Donald had several children their firstborn a son was struck and killed by a car in infancy that's sad that is sad in 1985 she left her husband and six children and went to live with David life choices the couple was never legally married but Catherine changed her surname by deed poll to Bernie oh crimes then we will talk about the victims over a period of five weeks the Bernies abducted five women aged between 15 and 31 all of the victims except for one were raped and murdered the sole exception was their final victim who escaped the day after her abduction and led police to the Bernie house therefore ending their crime spree Mary Nielsen 22 year old Mary Nielsen was studying psychology at the University of Western Australia and working part time in a delicatessen when she met David at the spare parts yard where he worked David offered to sell her cheap tyres for her car someone else done that in another episode and subsequently gave her his phone number on the 6th of October 1986 she went to their house I may get graphic I'm just saying I might get graphic as I said I haven't pre-read this she was gagged chained to the bed and raped by David while Catherine observed she was taken to Glen Eagles National Park near Albany Highway in Bedfordale where she was raped again and strangled with a nylon cord he then stabbed her thinking it would speed up the decomposition as he quote read that in a book somewhere and they buried her in a shallow grave she would have received her degree for psychology from the university one year after her murder Susanna Candy two weeks after the murder of Mary Nielsen they abducted 15 year old Susanna Candy as she was hitchhiking along Stirling Highway in Claremont Australia she was an outstanding student at Hollywood Senior High School and lived at home with her parents and siblings in Nedlands Australia her father is one of the top um, surgeons in Western Australia after she went missing the Bernies forced her to send letters to her family to assure, to assure them that she was all right but the family feared for her life the Bernies had been cruising for hours looking for a victim when they spotted Susanna once she entered the car she was held at knife point while her hands were tied together she was taken back to the Willoughby house where she was gagged, chained to the bed and raped. After Bernie had finished raping the girl, Catherine got into the bed with them. She now knew that this turned David on. When they had both assaulted her, David tried to strangle the girl with a nylon cord, but she became hysterical. They both forced sleeping pills down her throat to calm her down. Once Susanna was asleep, David put the cord around her neck and told Catherine 
to prove her undying love for him by murdering the girl. Catherine complied with the demand and killed Susanna while David watched. When asked later why she did it, Catherine said, quote, because I wanted to see how strong I was within my inner self. I didn't feel a thing. It was like I expected. I was prepared to follow him to the end of the earth and do anything to see that his desires were satisfied. She was a female. Females hurt and destroy males. They buried Susanna near the grave of Mary Nielsen in the state forest. Now, if I was dating someone and they said, prove your love to me and kill that person, I would probably call the police or run. Not, oh, I'm going to test my inner strength. Nolene Patterson. On the 1st of November, they saw 31-year-old Nolene standing beside her car on the Canning Highway. She had run out of fuel while on her way home from her job at, as a bar manager at the Nedlands Golf Club. Once inside the car, she had a knife held to her throat. She was tied up and told not to move. She was taken back to Morehouse Street where David repeatedly raped her and then she was gagged and chained to the bed. The Burnies originally decided to murder her that same night, but David kept her prisoner in the house for three days and there were signs that he had developed an, an emotional attachment to Nolene. Catherine quickly became jealous and made an ultimatum. David would have to kill Pat, uh, Nolene or Catherine would kill herself. He immediately forced an overdose of sleeping pills down Nolene's throat and strangled her while she slept. They took her body to the forest but buried it away from the others. Catherine reportedly got great pleasure from throwing stand, sand on Nolene's face. Denise Brown. On the 5th of November, the Burnies abducted 21-year-old Denise Brown as she was waiting for a bus on Stirling Highway. She accepted a ride from them. At knife point, she was taken to the house in Willoughby, chained to the bed and raped. The following afternoon, she was taken to the Wanneroo Pine Plantation in the seclusion of the forest, David raped Denise in the car while the couple waited for darkness. After they dragged Denise from the car, David raped her again and stabbed Denise in the neck. Convinced that she was dead, they dug a shallow grave, laid her body in it, but Denise sat up in the grave. David then grabbed an axe and struck her twice in the head he buried her body in the grave. Kate Moore. 17 year old Kate was abducted at knife point after accepting a ride from the Burnies. Kate later stated that she asked them if they intended to kill or rape her and was informed, quote, we'll only rape you if you're good. She was forced to dance for them and slept in the couple's bed while handcuffed to David. Kate was their final abductee and the only victim to survive. After abducting her, David held a knife to her throat and forced her to ring her mother. Kate assured her mother that she had too much to drink and was staying at a friend's house, hoping her mother would catch onto the ruse and call the friend knowing that she was not a drinker. She escaped the day after her capture. After David went to work, Catherine went to the door to carry out a drug deal and forgot to chain Kate to the bed. She escaped by climbing through a closed window by breaking its lock. However, she hit her head on the concrete. After knocking on various neighbours' doors, she jumped a gate and was attacked by David's dog. 
she managed to flee and ran into a vacuum cleaner shop on the 10th of November 1986. She was later described she later described herself as quote hysterical I'm barefoot wearing my black leggings and a black singlet no knickers she informed the shop owner that she had been raped when the police arrived she said that she had been abducted at knife point by a couple who had taken her back to their house and raped her the police were initially skeptical of her story but 22 year old constable laura hancock believed her from the outset due to the amount of detail she provided including their address and telephone number the burnies had given themselves aliases but kate had read david's name on a medi- on a medicine bottle kate stated that they had watched the film rocky on vhs and described a drawing she had concealed in the house as proof of her presence subsequently the police found her drawing in the home as well as the vhs copy that's videotape for you young ones out there um of rocky in their vcr which is a video recorder Catherine and David were arrested and during their interviews they gave conflicting information. Catherine denied ever meeting Kate while David insisted Kate had come over to the house voluntarily to engage in consensual sex. You'd have think they'd have got their story straight long before. Never mind. Detective Sergeant Vince convinced David to confess and reveal where they had buried the bodies so that they could be dug up before dark. David revealed that there were four graves. There is speculation that the Burnies were responsible for the disappearance of Cheryl Renwick in May 1986 and Barbara Weston in, nine, in June 1986. It, had, it has been suggested that David was responsible for the disappearance of Lisa Marie Mott in 1980. However, his first wife accounted for his whereabouts on the day that Lisa Marie disappeared. When sent to trial, David pleaded guilty to four counts of murder and one count each of abduction and rape. When asked why he had pleaded guilty, he gestured towards the victim's families and said quote it's the least i could do he was sentenced to four terms of life imprisonment after being found sane enough to stand trial catherine was also sentenced to four terms of life imprisonment by the supreme court of western australia under law at the time both were required to serve 20 years before being eligible for parole. Initially, David was held at the maximum security Fremantle prison, but he was soon moved to solitary confinement to keep him from coming to harm from other prisoners. Three of the original death row cells were converted for him, and he stayed there until the prison was closed in 1991. They converted three cells. I mean, that's luxury, isn't it? In in the scheme of prison. The cell can occasionally be viewed on the true crime tour held daily at Fremantle Prison. While incarcerated, Bernies exchanged more than 2,600 letters but were not allowed any other form of contact. David was found dead in his cell at, I can't pronounce that, Kajurina Prison on the 7th of October 2005 at 4.30am. He was 54 years old. An inquest found that he had hung himself from an air vent using a length of cord. Various factors led to his suicide. 
a failure to provide him with his antidepressants had ag- exacerbated his depression. His computer had been confiscated. He was allowed a computer. Is this a regular thing or... His computer was confiscated and he was suspected of sexually assaulting another prisoner. Well, don't say. He was described by a former prison officer as a, quote, model prisoner who looked after injured animals. Where did the animals come from? Catherine was not allowed to attend his funeral. Catherine was imprisoned at Bandiop Women's Prison. Bandiop. Bandiop. (laughs) Sorry. Since being incarcerated, she has worked as a prison librarian and appeared in a prison production of Nonsense. Nonsense. In 2007, her parole application was rejected and the then Attorney General of Western Australia, Jim McGinty, said that her release was unlikely while he remained in office. Go Jim McGinty. Her case was to be reviewed again in January 2010. However, on the 14th of March 2009, a new West Australia New Western Australian Attorney General Christian Porter, following requests from the victim's families, determined she could she would stay in jail for life. This decision makes her the third Australian woman. Oh, we're going to have to look these two up. After Catherine Knight and Patricia Byers, I'm going to look those up, and we will do um, episodes on those to have her papers marked never to be released. Her appeal of this decision was turned down in March 2010 by the same one who said, yeah, you're not coming out. Her fourth bid for parole was declined in 2016. In 2016, the Kate, the final victim who survived, began a campaign to end Western Australian laws that automatically put convicts up for parole every three years. Kate has stated that Bernie has never even applied for parole. In 2017, Catherine's youngest son, Peter, called for her execution. He had stated that his association with Catherine has resulted in him being assaulted and he supports Kate's campaign. Now this is sad because the whole story um, it is, is tragic. And something I've realised doing these episodes is that as true crime fanatics we are morbidly curious about the individuals that commit these heinous crimes. But in the mix of that, you have truly innocent people who have lost their lives or suffered a great deal of trauma. Not only for those victims, but their whole family. I mean, there was five victims, so there's five families all having to deal with this. It's so, so tragic. But she is still in prison. He has died by hanging himself because that's what cowards do. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, yeah. I am going to look up Catherine Knight and Patricia Byers and see what those despicable people did. And I will bring those up in future episodes. Thank you so much for joining me. I know you are loving the true crime. And I'm glad to keep you company. Thank you for keeping me company. And I shall see you next week. Love, hugs and sparkles to you all. 
Stay safe out there. Bye.